another in Kyoto, October 9th, 1869. Vice Minister of War Amura Masujiro runs down the stairs, pursued by men with swords. He bleeds from multiple wounds, including a deep one on his leg, and two of his friends lay dead upstairs. Omura is the man who won the Boshin War, and it was he who modernized the Choshu forces using Napoleonic tactics and peasant conscripts to topple the shogun. Now he's pushing for the same reforms on the Imperial Army, but that would end the samurai as a warrior class stripping them of their swords, the very swords they're chasing him with. He gets out the back door, but can hear his pursuers gaining on him. Desperate, he climbs into a bathtub, watching as his blood clouds the murky water. He puts his head underneath. And as he holds his breath for what feels like an eternity, his assassins storm past unknowingly and continue their search into the night. The Boshin War may have been over, with the shogunate toppled and the Meiji Emperor restored, but the political violence that had rocked Japan was by no means finished. And given the amount of blood spilled and bitter political divides, you might think that that all began with a wave of emperor-ordered executions. But it didn't. In fact, no one was executed at all. The Tokugawa lands were seized and made part of the state, and leaders of the shogunate force were arrested and held under home confinement for a few years. But by 1872, all were pardoned and most back working for the government. Even Tokugawa Yoshinobu, the last shogun, was sent to a comfortable retirement in his domain. It was a savvy political move. The idea was to unite the country by, essentially, taking everyone at their word that they had been fighting for what they thought was the good of the emperor. The argument went that everyone had acted honorably and it was over now. In fact, victorious imperials even celebrated the heroism of shogunate troops. For example, a group of samurai known as the White Tigers who committed seppuku when they believed their castle had fallen, praising them as examples of military valor. They even installed the spirits of all of the war dead in a common shrine. But just because there was little official punishment didn't mean nothing would change. In fact, everything would change. During the Boshin War, the emperor and his court had issued a decree known as the Charter Oath. This five-point plan laid out the government's aims during the new Meiji era, which did involve seismic change, though was also worded vaguely enough to be flexible. The five points were 1. Deliberative assemblies with decisions made by public discussion. 2. All classes would be united in carrying out state policy. 3. Common people were allowed to pursue their own calling. 4. Evil customs of the past would be discontinued. And 5. Knowledge should be sought out throughout the world and used to strengthen imperial rule. And it was that fifth one that was really interesting, because it was essentially an official abandonment of Sono Joy. Even though the movement had brought the emperor to power, this new Japan would embrace Western technology along with the Western experts that must be brought in to get Japan up to speed. It was also how the Imperials got the Western nations on their side during the Boshin War. No more xenophobic attacks on foreigners would be tolerated. That got in the way of the main project, strengthening the country through economic reform, infrastructure projects, industrialization, and of course, military enhancement. That old phrase, revere the emperor, expel the barbarians, was out. And in was a new rallying cry, enrich the country, strengthen the military. And as you can imagine, this was not all that well received among those who'd fought on the imperial side during the Boshin War, because their main objective was to shut foreign powers out of Japan and let the country develop along its own lines. But what the emperor and his reformist advisors now favored was the exact same foreign policy as the shogunate, to gradually renegotiate the unequal treaties, using its modernization as an argument that it should be treated equally with the other colonial powers. And while that might have disturbed traditionalists like the Satsuma leader Saigo Takamori, the government believed it had no other option. And that was the clear message brought back by the Iwakura mission, which between 1871 and 1873 sent diplomats on a tour through the United States and Europe, both to open negotiations and to study Western technology and government. Two of the men on that mission, Okubo Toshimichi of Satsuma and Kido Takayoshi of Choshu, would return with a grim message. Japan could not survive outside pressure without modernization, trade, and industrialization. Their artisans could not compete with the cheap Western manufactured goods, and with the unequal treaties disallowing Japan from instituting any protective tariffs or import duties, their choice was to either industrialize or have an economic crash. Okubo and Kido would end up with major roles in the government, known along with Saigo Takamori as the three great nobles of the Restoration, the core of a new oligarchy that controlled politics and development. 
and these three men and their coalition government were about to completely change what it meant to be a samurai. It was clear that the samurai system, the whole caste system of Japan in fact, was incompatible with a modern state. First of all, you can't have a centralized government when the country's divided up by hereditary lords. Kido especially argued it was a recipe for instability and dysfunction, so he proposed the solution. He convinced his Satsuma and Shoshu allies to voluntarily turn their domains over to the emperor, who, in turn, reappointed them as governors. From now on, they would be government employees rather than lords. Their domains would be renamed prefectures, and their samurai paid by the government rather than the daimyo himself. Indeed, the position of daimyo ceased to exist, with all former daimyo instead given a hereditary aristocratic title that did not confer land. And samurai were similarly transitioned to a class without special privileges, many of them invited to join the bureaucracy or military. Then, two years later, the three nobles moved on the prefecture system again, this time offering a stipend, which would later have to be converted to government bonds due to financial problems in return for many of the holdout ex-daimyo to retire so their former domains could be consolidated into 72 prefectures. All this was met with grumbling, even armed resistance. But then came the next, more radical step, army modernization. Now, though we talked about military modernization last episode, it would have been more accurate to discuss it in terms of weapons modernization. The Satsuma and Shoshu forces had modern guns and some new tactics, but only a few units were truly modern troops, with uniforms and rank structure. Other than that, it was a free-for-all. Samurai would go into battle wearing a western suit with two swords and a rifle, or a Napoleonic uniform with a katana and a revolver. Now, was it steampunk samurai awesome? Oh, heck yeah. But efficient? Not exactly. So weapon and uniform standardization was on the agenda when Vice Minister of War Omura Masujiro began revamping the Imperial Japanese Army. But he believed in more than that. Omura was part of a faction that thought the samurai were incompatible with the equal society they dreamed of. He wanted to abolish the samurai, strip their special rights like killing peasants, ban all symbols of rank like their top knot and right to carry swords, and turn the army into a force of conscripted peasants. Not only would this take away the necessity of a warrior class, it would dissolve the private daimyo armies that could destabilize the country or stand up to the central government, and Amura was killed for it. Because while he did survive the attack we described at the beginning of the episode, the dirty bathwater he hid in ended up fatally infecting the wound in his leg. As you can imagine, many samurai were furious about these reforms, but the situation didn't fully explode until 1873, when Korea refused to recognize the Meiji Emperor, leading to a debate about whether Japan should invade. But then Saigo Takamori argued that this was the perfect solution. See, the samurai were feudal lords, right? And if that wasn't working in Japan, why not just let them do that in Korea? Huh? All powerful countries have colonies, after all. And the samurai, you see, could be the tip of the Japanese spear, huh? And to try to further his plan, the restless Saigo even offered to go to Korea as a diplomat and behave boorishly in order to provoke his own assassination, creating a pretext for the war. So it's not Japan's fault. Get it? It's all coming together. The government said no. Sure, they did want to invade Korea, but they wanted to strengthen the state first. This was the final straw for Saigo. He went back to Satsuma and opened military academies for disaffected samurai, gradually cutting ties with the imperial government he helped create. This was the first step on the road to the Satsuma Rebellion and the last stand of the samurai. Legendary Patron Remix, Ahmed Ziad Turk, Gunnar Clovis, Alicia Bramble, Kyle Murgatroyd, Casey Muscha, O'Reels One, and Dominic Valenciana. Thank you so much. 